I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder of Traction Conf and Boast AI. Thanks for joining us. Super excited for today's session, how to reach a 10 million ARR on a shoestring budget. Not many people I know have taken companies from zero to 10. And our speaker today, Matt Epstein, has done that twice. He was employee number one at Zenefits. He created a leading HR brand and helped them go from zero to 65 million ARR. And today he's helped Rippling go from zero to unicorn status over 10 million ARR. And he's done it twice and driving major impact with a minor budget. Matt, how are you in Corona times? Uh, I, I feel like I've watched everything there is to watch on Netflix. I literally turned on Netflix and it, it just said, you've won. And you learned to DJ recently. How is that going? Tell us more. About well, it's going well for me because I, I enjoy it. Uh, it's probably not going well for my girlfriend who has to listen to my terrible music. Can't go outside, nothing else to do. So, you know, here I am six months later pretending to be a DJ. Just to follow up on the introduction, obviously what I'm here to talk to you guys today about is how to get to 10 million in ARR on a shoestring startup budget. And really, you know, what I found after doing this a few times is in the early days, it really comes down to three things. Um, obviously beyond product market fit. So one is finding the killer message. Two is, you know, how you grow on the cheap. And then three, building that initial small SWAT team that gets you there and what that team actually looks like. This was already covered in the intro, but I have been through this twice now. At Rippling, my current company, I joined as one of the first few employees. Uh, the second marketer, one was an operations person and, you know, two salespeople. And at Zenefits, I joined as the first employee where I literally didn't get paid for six months. Uh, Parker, the founder, paid me in Papalote burritos, which for those of you outside of SF, Papalote is like a really great uh, Mexican uh, burrito spot. And eventually, you know, we did get our first few customers and then fortunately moved out of Parker's kitchen and into this broom closet where my budget was effectively zero. And so at Zenefits, you know, we went from zero to 10 million uh, in, in about a year on less than a million dollar budget with a two person marketing team. And I was one of those two people. And at Rippling, at least in the early days, uh, cause I've been here, I've been at Rippling two years, have a very, very, very similar story to tell. <clears throat> in fact, you know, even more significant, but, but can't share the numbers. So, you know, Hopefully today I can leave you guys with at least one or two tips and maybe some high level guidance that can help you get there as well. Um, but hopefully, you know, this gives you a reason to believe I, I, I know at least one or two things about, uh, you know, getting to hyper growth uh, with little to no money. So the first step is finding the killer message. And the reason why this is so important is because everything you do is built on this message. It doesn't matter if you're doing Facebook advertising. It doesn't matter if you're doing uh, uh, LinkedIn advertising, radio, outdoor, doesn't matter. If you don't have a message that cuts through the noise and captures people's attention, nothing you do is going to work. So the question is, is how do you figure out what that message is? What I think most companies do is they pontificate and sort of go back and forth internally and, and they just put something out there that they think is right. But the truth is, the truth is, is that more often than not, you don't know what's right. And there is actually a scientific way to figure out what works. So what I did at Zenefits and what I did at Rippling was I actually spent my first, I'd call it probably first 90 days doing nothing except testing messaging. And there's really three tools you can use to get a data back answer as to what is the message that works. And that's by leveraging SEM, uh, Google PPC, display ads, uh, Google Display Network, and Facebook. And so what the process looks like, how it essentially works, is you keep coming up with different ways of explaining your product. And usually that boils down to some sort of tagline, not like a branding tagline, but like a way to describe your product. And then a very, very short boilerplate description. So this is if a, tick, if a 
a fictitious example that is somewhat similar to, to Rippling or what we did at Rippling. But, you know, what, what we did, and first, let me give you some context on Rippling. This is like my 60 second Rippling pitch, but let me give you context on what we do so you understand these examples. Um, so what Rippling does, or I should say is first to market to do, is it gives businesses the first way to manage everything that touches their employees in one place. So their payroll, their benefits, their computers, their, their apps. Um, that way, when you, for instance, hire someone inside of Rippling, you can set up their payroll, their health insurance, all their documents, their computer, all the applications they use like Slack and Zoom. You can set all that stuff up in 90 seconds for the first time ever. So back to this example, now, how do you, how do you explain that? in a few words, right? What is the message that works? So in this example, there's kind of two things you could do. We can either have a, you know, all in one HR and IT software, the first way to manage all of your HR and IT in one place from your payroll and benefits to devices and apps to employee management platform. The first way to manage everything your employees need from their payroll, their payroll benefits, devices, apps, and more. So you can kind of see here, the difference, they're somewhat similar. Um, they're two, two different, they're two sides of the same coin, but the question is, which is more effective? And so what you do first is you run ads on SEM. And this is really what helps you understand what is that sort of four or five word description of your product that captures people, people's attention. All in one HR and IT software or employee management platform. And what you'll, you know, what you'll find is one of these will have a higher click through rate. And it's it's the perfect test because you have a basically a, a audience who is in the market to buy. And so that's what makes SCM particularly powerful, is it allows you with data to see which message appeals to the buyer. Then you do the same thing, and this is usually all at the same time with display with display ads. Um and you could do this both on Facebook and on Google Display Network, or just one or the other, doesn't really matter. Although the more, the better, obviously, from a data perspective. So you can see here, right? All in one HRIT is the message down here. I didn't have time to create the second row, but the second row would be employee management platform. So what you'll find is that one of these, again, what you're looking for is click-through rate. People who just see four words and go, huh, that's interesting, tell me more. <clears throat> Then once you kind of have that high level descriptor, you need to figure out your elevator pitch. Um, and so how do you do that? Um, and again, this is literally what I've done twice in a row. I've done three things. So the first is I literally hopped on demos and sold clients. I did that at Zenefits. I did that at Rippling. In fact, at Zenefits, I'm pretty sure I closed like our first 2 million there are. <laughs> um, and what that allows you to do is to not just walk the walk, but talk the talk and actually have conversations with the customer in a buyer setting, hear their objections and sort of tweak your objection that your objection handling over time. Because if you can, as a marketer, effectively close a client on a demo, then you can effectively, you know, create marketing that captures their attention. Then the question is, is okay, I sort of have the long-winded version of that. Now, how do I sell my grandma? And I always use the grandma test. I love my grandma. She's great. Because, you know, it really forces you to explain something as quickly and as simply as humanly possible. If you can explain your product to your grandmother um, and she understands it and understands it quickly, then odds are, uh, you know, you'll be able to market it really easily as well. Because marketing, oftentimes you have four or five words to describe something and, and maybe, you know, 60 seconds to pitch it. And then lastly is cold email, probably the, the most important piece here. So let's say, for instance, HR and IT one, that way of describing Rippling, it's the first way to manage all of your HR and IT in one place from your payroll and benefits to devices and apps. So now how do you, you know, okay, I, I have sort of the high level positioning, I have the general pitch down. Now, how do I explain this, you know, in writing? So I'll just very quickly let you guys read the, these two emails so you can see the difference. Hopefully some of you took away from this was it's, it's the same message just through a slightly different lens. So 
you know, the one on the left is really talking about the pain point of the administrative burden, the, the fact that you don't have this team on staff today, and it's putting a ton of, of work on your lap. The other is just about system consolidation. So same positioning, just different messaging. And what basically you'll find through all of this testing at the end of the day, if you've done it right, and by right, I mean, you have found a message that cuts through the clutter. You want to be looking for two things. You want to be looking for one, a display CTR that is 2x the others. On SEM, on Facebook, you want the, 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 the winning message should have a 2x CTR. And then the email to demo rate should be at least 1%. So if you email 100 people, one of them will say, I am willing to give you 45 minutes of your time. That is ultimately when you know you've got the message that works. And so again, at Zenefits, at Rippling, I did this exact same exercise. Um, I ran the ads and I found, I'll give you the example of Zenefits because this is actually a real example. The thing that worked 3x better than everything else was all in one HR, payroll benefits compliance. I didn't even like that message all that much, but it turned out that that's just worked, that that is what worked the best. And the email to demo rate was the other thing I look for. If you have that 1%, that means for every 100 people you pitch your product to, one will be interested. That is how you know you've got a winner. And once you know you got a winner, you can take it and apply it to everything. Again, Facebook, outdoor, TV, commercial, doesn't matter. Now let's talk about how you actually grow on the cheap. So I know a lot of you guys on this call are startups, and I'm sure some of you already have investors. And if you've had a board meeting or, or you've spoken to VCs or anyone, general consensus from every VC, the guidance is grow more and burn less, which of course is in direct opposition, especially when you're a startup, with very limited money and you have to show, you know, these hyper growth uh, uh, curves, but you have no money to spend. <laughs> so how do you do that? I have done two, I have done, I have basically taken this methodology and done it twice. So what I do is when I first join, I have the message, I say, okay, what are we going to do to grow? Um, so what I do is I assume that my marketing budget is just going to be 20% of our estimated ARR for the end of the year. So, okay, that's my pot of money. Then I stack rank. I, I, uh, I think of every single channel you could possibly use and I stack rank it by first, what is the growth potential? Then two, what is the time required to execute? Three is cost and four is scalability. If something has high growth potential, but takes two years to execute, how are you going to hit hyper growth? Probably not. A good example of that, for instance, is partnerships. Partnerships, oftentimes they look really appealing and they do have huge growth potentials, but they can take years and years to pull off. Um, or scalability is another one. For instance, people oftentimes, you know, think, oh, why, you know, Yes, this has huge growth potential, but it's super unscalable. That, that doesn't really matter because if you get something to work that has really high growth potential, you can always worry about scalability later or raise money you know, to basically solve that problem. So I stack rank it. And then what you'll find, you'll end up with really three things that you want to spend your very limited time, money, and focus on. This is just like an example. Email, for instance, for a lot of companies is the first choice. You know, why is it the first choice? Because it has high growth potential. It's easily scalable. It's very low cost. Um, depending on your market, for instance, Facebook could be the same thing. So the, the trick really is to, is to have conviction in your stacked ranked list and then test and fail and learn as fast as humanly possible and to cut your losses as soon as humanly possible. If you're working on Facebook and your payback period is 10 years, odds are you're not gonna get Facebook to work anytime soon. So move on to the next thing, um, cut your losses early. And again, it's, it's important when you're a team of 10 people, the harder part, part is always not what to do, it's, it's almost always what not to do. And I think especially startups have a tendency to get distracted and to do things that feel good, but don't necessarily perform. So like events is, is a very, is a, it, events and content are, are two very good examples. They feel good. You can make progress, but 
is it going to be the thing that gets you 3x growth? I mean, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a 10 person startup and I'm using my stack rank list, events aren't very scalable. They're very expensive content, same exact thing. Obviously I'm not being, I can't be too specific here because this is just so different based off your industry and product, but the sort of main takeaway from this section is not the stack ranking because that's, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys are already doing that. It's actually about once you've identified your list, it's about how you execute that list. And the thing is, or at least the thing I've learned is that the, the sort of unnatural growth that you get at companies like Zenefits and Rippling and very high growth companies, it's almost always from one of two things. People are doing something entirely new in a channel or they're fishing an entirely new channel. So what I like to say is if everyone is fishing in the same pond, then you need to fish in a completely, you need to fish in that pond in a completely new way. This took me about five hours in Photoshop. Um, I didn't have the support of my design team. And so an example of that is like, let's take direct mail, right? You might stack rank your list and say, for instance, you know, lenders oftentimes have a lot of success in, in direct mail uh, or FinTech products. You might say, I wanna do direct mail. I could promise you if you do direct mail like this, you are not going to see outsized growth. It's just not going to happen. Now, if you do direct mail like this, you might see outsized growth. Now, to be clear, this completely bombed. Uh, but for every 20 stupid, crazy ideas we have at Rippling, one usually pays off pretty big. Um, so what we did was we basically shipped 3,000 pre-made pizza boxes to people with a handwritten note that basically said, hey, Jane, yes, this box is empty, but it's full of potential. And then we kind of go on to give the pitch of Rippling. This is, this is the difference between working and not working in almost every case that I have seen. Unless you're, you are, your product is literally first to market and you have no competitors, which is pretty rare. The other option you have is if everyone is fishing in the same pond, then you could just say, screw it. I'm going to fish an entirely new pond that no one's fishing in, at least in your competitor set. And so one example of that that we did that worked quite well was no one in our space was really taking advantage of outdoor. And so we ran a bunch of outdoor campaigns um, and took advantage of a channel that no one was working in that, that worked quite well. And one of the things we did that was sort of crazy and out of the box was we put up this competitor ad. And just for quick context, there's a company called Gusto, which does payroll benefits and HR for very, very small companies. We were seeing a, a ton of companies coming to us, basically saying we're outgrowing Gusto in terms of feature set. That's why we came to Rippling. So we ran this very innocuous, innocent ad, um, basically saying outgrowing Gusto, presto changeo, um, with the tagline work magic. And there was more billboards that basically, you know, spoke to the power of the system, you know, run payroll in 90 seconds, work magic kind of thing. <clears throat> um, now, Gusto actually ended up sending us a cease and desist letter, which we then replied to with a poem in iambic pentameter. I don't know for sure, but my guess is this is probably the first time anyone has replied to a legal team in iambic pentameter. Um, but you can read it. Uh, Dear Gusto, our billboard struck a nerve, it seems, and so you phoned your legal teams who started shouting cease, desist, and other threats too long to list. The poem goes on, and you can read it out line. It's actually, it's actually pretty fun. Um, we, we obviously intended it in good spirits, and as a result, we ended up getting you know, a bunch of press on a bunch of sites. So long story short, it's not just about sort of taking the time to stack rank and prioritize and really think through if I have a year to show unnatural growth, what am I going to do? But it's about recognizing that once you have that list, if all you're doing is table stakes, it's going to be really hard to achieve outsized growth. It's not that you won't do well or you won't grow. It's going to be really hard to get that sort of 3x you know, kind of growth. Lastly you know, what I wanted to talk to you guys about was just what does that initial team look like? Um, I, it, it's always mind blowing to me how many startups don't even hire a marketing person until they're like, you know, 30 plus people, because I think a lot of marketers 
are not sort of, they don't have a growth lean. They do things like content and things that oftentimes don't move the needle in a dramatic fashion. And so I have sort of, at this point, if there's one thing I feel very good about it is, it is what that sort of initial two-person team looks like. This, this team, just to be clear, is what drives all the revenue. So both at Zenefits and at Rippling, marketing drove 100% of the revenue, at least in the very beginning. Um, when I say that 10 million number, that was 100% marketing. So the first hire, the most important hire is your Swiss army knife. This was effectively me, but this is sort of a jack of all trades, master of none, who can really sort of do everything. They can, you know, brand and design, product ma marketing, campaign management, agency management, um, sales development and sales. Those are really the main buckets. This is, you know, it, it, you could be hiring someone sort of who's a senior marketer who wants to take the next step in their career and is sort of looking to prove themselves and get a director or a VP role. It's someone who knows enough about each of these buckets to be dangerous and that is creative and hacky enough to execute on. The second, and this is, again, this is the first hire I have made at every single company I've been at is marketing operations. Another hire I see, unfortunately, hired far, far, far too late. And this is essentially the brains of the operation. And if you're small, you're really sort of early on, they can do a lot of stuff. They can do your Marketo administration, which is all of your marketing automation and your email. They can set up and configure and help you administer your sales force. They can also execute all of your campaigns on Facebook and, and AdWords, or at least they can work with agencies to do that. And they can set up your very early, early initial sort of basic rudimentary reporting. And then lastly, manage all your data. So if I could only have two people in the world when I start, if I ever started my own startup, one of the first outside of engineers to build the product, the first two hires I would make would be, would be this person, the Swiss Army Knife, and the marketing ops person. And again, at Rippling and Zenefits, it, 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 that was literally it. It was me and a marketing operations person at both places, and we were able to hit that number. Lastly, leaning heavily on agencies and freelancers. A very common mistake I see is people bringing these roles in-house early on. And the truth is you don't need them for a long time. So SEM paid social, you can hire agencies and contractors to test SEM and see if that it's even, you could even acquire people profitably. PR, I would never hire a firm. The thing you'll learn about PR firms is that when you're small and unnoteworthy, no matter what they tell you, they are going to put the kid right out of college on your account. And oh, by the way, they're going to charge you an obscene amount of money. So if you do want press, I would recommend freelancers. Third is uh, a design. Uh, again, easily outsourceable. You can get it for cheap. Um, you don't have to bring that in-house for a long time. And then lastly, front-end development. In fact, by the way, we still have, we only have one design director and like, 10 freelancers. We still don't have any in-house designers and we're 500 people. Uh, this is for marketing, just to be clear. So after that, the next two hires are either in parallel or depending on your needs, one or the other, but a growth lead, someone to really take all the campaign management off your plate, and then a product marketer, someone to you know take more of the pro product marketing work off of that, that Swiss Army Knife's plate. With this team of people, Swiss Army Knife, your marketing ops person, your growth lead, and your PMM, you can get really, 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 really far. We only have a 12-person marketing team, just for context, and we have, you know, like 50 sales reps. Last few pieces of advice before we get into QA, just basically common mistakes I see companies make and advice I wish I, I would have given myself earlier. One is to launch fast and fail faster. If you, are, if you are a small startup and you are happy with the work you're putting out, then you're taking too long. You, you should never be happy with the work you're putting out because it means you took too much time. And oftentimes, the stuff that works is the stuff that I never even thought was going to work. And so the, 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 sort of, the trick is to test and fail as fast as humanly possible to get to the thing that works. And it's very rare at least in my career, that I have ever just sort of done something on the first try and gotten it right. 
Two is to hire people with grit, creativity, and raw horsepower. I think people oftentimes optimize for colleges and, and logos from places like Google and Apple and all those places. But those people at early stage companies almost never pan out. They don't deal well in chaos. They never really sort of created things from the ground up or have the temperament to do that. And so the people that you really want to look for are the ones with almost a chip on their shoulder that have something to prove and that are super creative. Because those are the people, and I could think of three people off the top of my head as benefits and, and rippling that can literally change the course of your company. And it's, I have personally never found that from the guy who, or, you know, woman who has worked at Google for 10 years. And then lastly, always start with what would I do if I had unlimited resources? So this is actually a lesson I learned at Zenefits where we, you know, we had an incredibly aggressive growth goal and I, you know, basically went to Parker and I was like, look, this isn't, this isn't possible. Like, I can't, I can't do it because of this budget. It's, you know, all these reasons why I couldn't do it. And what, you know, basically Parker said after he you know, had calmed me down, he, he said, well, okay, let's do this. What if you had unlimited resources? If I gave you infinite money and headcount, what would you do? I sort of took a second and I thought about it. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, if I had unlimited, I would do X, Y, Z. And it very quickly turned into the answer. Well, this is what we should do. And, you know, then the question became, how do we, how do we just like get an alpha of this out the door so that we can fundraise to sort of scale that or dedicate resources, like engineering resources to solve it. And I think many people, myself included, they're not trained to sort of think, if I had infinite possibilities, what would I do? They think, well, I have one headcount and $100,000. What would I do? And I think that really limits your ideas and basically kills good ideas on the vine. So that's all I had for you guys. My goal here was to just hopefully give you one or two tips and maybe some rough guidance that you could take to think about growth differently at a startup and get to that same level of growth without having to spend a ton of money because I, you know, I think I'm living proof that it is, it is possible. And if anything, I think not having money oftentimes puts your back against a wall and makes you come up with very creative solutions to problems that people usually just throw money at. So with that said, I'll open it up to Q and A and uh, happy to answer any questions you guys have. Awesome. That was fantastic. I want to start with that question there. What would uh, you do if you had unlimited resources and you, you came up with uh, all these ideas? How did you prioritize that? Like, how did you distill it down? Because when you have unlimited resources, you probably have like almost unlimited ideas too, right? The problem came down to scalability and headcount. Well, it came down to three things. Scalability, headcount, actually money was sort of a distant third, but how we ended up solving it once we said, okay, this actually, this could work, but we don't have the money or people. I ended up hiring like 20 people in the Philippines and taking an engineer from one of the product teams and lo and behold, like it worked. Had I not gone through that exercise, I would have never come up with that idea in a million years. And then we talk about like shoestring budgets and whatnot before you guys raise the money. This was all effectively you doing it right? At Zenefits in the, in the early days. Yeah. You basically testing out the messaging, the ads and, and whatnot. And how did you decide on the, on the channels there? Uh, because like you talked a lot about like SEM and whatnot, but like, I didn't see much on Facebook or LinkedIn in that equation. It really came down to, again, the revenue goal backing into that. Okay. 20 per, if I'm going to, let's say our budget will be 20% of that revenue goal. This is how much money I have. And given the growth goal, like the velocity we would need, it became somewhat easy. Like again, depending on your industry, this is very different, but SEM is like a good example of where I see many people start. The problem with SEM is, is the house always wins. Basically the, the game is rigged uh, in Google's favor. And so AdWords is oftentimes something where you'll just end up blowing a shitload of money very quickly. And even if you get business, you'll find out very later, once your company's mature, that it's wildly unprofitable. Um, so 
that's why I sort of didn't start with something like SEM, or at least the first thing I started with was email, because we can service every every company, basically the, the United States or even the world needs payroll, benefits, HR, IT. And so I basically said, okay, we can service every company in the US. Email is scalable. It's cheap. Uh, and it has high growth potential. The thing I focused on was email. And the question is, is how do you do that at scale reliably and really well? And so that's where a lot of my focus went. Email still performs the same way, or do you uh, sort of transform that or, or morph that to LinkedIn and whatnot? How do you see LinkedIn sort of playing into this equation? Or maybe it doesn't. Yeah. So the thing I, another lesson I learned about sort of growth is Anything you come up with has a, sh any, anytime you discover something fundamentally new or really innovative from a growth perspective, it has like a 12 month shelf life. Marketers talk, growth people talk, and whatever idea you come up with, people will have it almost immediately. Or, you know, in 12 months, it'll, you'll see the effectiveness like fall by half because everyone else is doing it. Uh, so there's, there's actually a ton of like, emails that we created as benefits that you will now see everywhere um, that were like originally created by our team. I don't want to like get into them, but you could Google it. You could find a few. Um, so long story short, the thing is, is again, there's only so many channels in your tool belt. This is what I meant by finding a different way to fish in the same pond as everyone else. If you have a channel you basically, if you are not going to do something fundamentally new or different, you're going to get the exact same conversion rates, if not worse, because everyone else has more money, better, you know, better brands, all that kind of stuff. And so email, for instance, what we are doing on the email side at Rippling is nothing like what we did at Zenefits, but it is the same in terms of the amount of engineering and sort of problem solving that we put into it. And so we, you know, we basically said, okay, everyone's doing this now. Let's do email this completely different way. What's in your marketing tool belt to manage all of this? Like from like maybe sales development to marketing automation. We have a pretty basic stack. I mean, really the only diversity in our stack comes from like, you know, data providers, but on, you know, the main stack is marketing automation system. So we use Marketo. Um, that's all of your attribution, tagging, email automation. Uh, then there's your CRM. I think a lot of startups making the mistake, do make the mistake of getting Salesforce in the beginning, which unless you think you are really going to be a high growth company, almost never works out because it requires a dedicated person, tons of maintenance. It's very expensive. It's like 150 bucks per person. Um, so for that, you know, there's things like Pipedrive or other CRMs, but we have Salesforce. Um, and then outreach for sales, for sales reps, although we don't let salespeople send any cold email. So a very common mistake you see today, I think in tech, uh, companies arm their sales reps with outreach. And now you have, you know, 20 kids right out of college sending 100,000 emails a month, <clears throat> basically spamming the world. Um, so I think that is sort of a, a dangerous thing to give sales reps. You don't have control over it, but we do give it to them mostly for follow-up sequences for prospects, optimizely for A-B testing, um, and lastly, a bunch of data providers. But our stack isn't super, you know, complex to be quite I thought, I thought you were going to say we, we built a bunch of stuff and whatnot, but this is, this is good. It gives me hope that like folks like me can go and subscribe to a bunch of things and, and, and grow. You talked about the danger of lots of cold emails going on. Everyone is cold emailing, e-blasting and whatnot. How do you, what are your recommendations to getting around that? So the first thing is, have you, have you gone through that exercise that I spoke about in the beginning? Have you gotten, you know, are you getting a 1% conversion rate on your emails? Like if not, you're already doing it wrong because you don't have a message that works. Second thing is email just comes down to intent signals and personalization. So once you have your sort of core message that works, how do you identify signals with data to know that this person's in the market? Um, and then 
Third is obviously the delivery of the email. How do you actually get it into someone's inbox? Um, and that is the much harder piece that I think a lot of people struggle with today. Um, and I think where the market has shifted is to basically giving salespeople outreach, which on one hand is great, but on the other hand, I think almost always is sort of abused and does more harm than good. Um, but for, by the way, sales reps don't send any cold email at, at Rippling, zero. Um, marketing manages everything. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I when I look at like conversion rates that go from like an outreach because it's connected to your Gmail or, or, or email, you're getting like 70, 80% uh, open rates. And for me, in some cases, I personally use Mixmax and I get like 80, 90% open rates, even on cold things. And then you look at uh, something that goes from SendGrid or MailChimp and you're getting like sub 30%, right? So that's, that's why yeah. I think it's it's landing in the salespeople's uh, hands here. Yeah, but, I mean, definitely a big shift that has happened from Zenefits days is sending email from Marketo and Mailchimp. Those days are long gone, which I think is you're right. Why, in partially, the market shifted to you know tools like Outreach. You were essentially the first Swiss Army knife there at Zenefits, right? Like you said, and, yeah. and so also perhaps at at, at Rippling. How do you like prioritize? Like, what is your thinking to like prioritize your role? Because it's multiple things: it's sales development, it's sales, it's uh, messaging, it's branding, it's a whole bunch of things. It really just comes down to a revenue number and what you need to do to get there. And I think people have what I call shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Um, again, I think what's often the hardest part is just what to say no to. And so I can't, even now at Rippling, I get people saying, when are we, you know, when can we get this? I say maybe next year, because it's just not, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, it's not important. Um, so for me at, at, you know, well, I'll just take Zenefits as an example. Um, for me, it was okay. This is to get to our, our A, we need to hit this number. What are the things I need to focus on? And so, you know, it, was, well, we need to basically come up with a pitch and a demo. We need to have a basic website that gets like a baseline performance. Um, and we need to have at least two channels that we can, you know, reliably in sort of a SaaS way, reliably and uh, reliably scale. Um, and so literally all I did was for the first year was find the message that works, which I did through literally selling clients and closing clients and creating the pitch and demo myself. Then the second thing was just creating a, a website that just met baseline. And third was working relentlessly on finding those two channels. And it, it was all back of the napkin math, you know, email for instance, okay, there's, you know, 8 million small businesses in the world. If we get X percent conversion rate and, you know, this many demos, and our close rate is this, and our average deal size is this, then we need to basically send and this many emails. Um, so more often than not, it's just, it's just back of the napkin math that rolls up to a revenue goal. And when you do that, everything else just sort of falls into the background because you realize, am I going to really spend a day on a content piece? Like why? A hundred people will see it. It'll make the sales team feel good, but is it gonna is it gonna get me an extra twenty thousand AR? Like no, definitely makes sense, and I like how you've said it very clearly. And I think marketing teams can be aligned the same way that if it doesn't tie to a revenue number, don't do it, right? And and marketers don't often think like sales or, or think in terms of revenue. Do you have a quota for marketing here, like a revenue number? They're rippling, you know, marketing still generates a majority of the revenue. So I, I oftentimes lay awake at night staring at the ceiling in a cold sweat. <laughs> you mentioned Facebook as one of the tactics. What are some things you've tried on Facebook that may have worked or some advice there? It really comes down to two main things. The first is really training the algorithm to find people that really match your target buyer. And there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do to train the algorithm. For instance, people who add a phone number 
and it's it's an actually valid phone number. So you validate the number on the back end. Basically, only fire the Facebook pixel for people who enter in a real phone number, because those people have a higher, you know, propensity to actually convert. Well, now Facebook's only looking for those kinds of people. Like how Facebook does that, I have no freaking clue. Um, but like the biggest thing is your targeting. And then obviously the second sort of lesser important thing is just the creative um, and constantly testing creative to reach some sort of baseline. But with Facebook, I, you know, I think it, it really primarily falls down to targeting and then to a lesser extent, you know, making sure your creatives don't fatigue. Uh, because they do eventually fatigue and you have to keep on, you know, it's like a hamster wheel. If on the founding team, the Swiss army knife doesn't exist, what are some hacks tips for finding that person? Yeah, this is, this is really, really tough. If I was basically a CEO hiring someone, what I would probably do is I would first check my network to see who does know a lot about this who could help interview this person for me. Literally marketer's job is to sell. And so oftentimes you can find, you can interview marketers who are really great at selling you and they would, they'll make you believe that they're amazing. But as soon as you, if you really know your stuff, if you dig down, you realize that they're, they're just great marketers, but they're just kind of selling you a, you know, a dream. So I would look for someone in my network who really did know a lot about growth and marketing, and I would have them interview the people that I was interested in. Um, but I would look for people profile-wise who you know have, let's say, like three to five years experience with a background where they were not the captain, they were the lieutenant, the one actually doing the stuff. You never, ever, ever want to hire the VP or the senior guy. Because they don't even remember what work looks like because they're so high up the layer cake. So you want like the guy one or two level or woman one or two levels beneath them who actually has done it. Have, you know, the person in your network sort of interview them to, to really gauge, does this person understand growth and do they understand marketing? Um, and then obviously the third thing is to look for a track record of where they have demonstrated their ability to take something from zero to one. But most importantly, just look for someone who you are convinced has like grit, hustle, and creativity. I mean, Parker, I'm laughing as I'm like giving you guys these guidelines because at the time I didn't have, I didn't have any of that. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't really have like the examples to point to. Parker, I think had a, like believed I knew my stuff because he had a front row seat, but I didn't have examples but to point to. I think Parker primarily picked me because he just believed he just believed I was smart, hungry, and creative. And it's those kinds of people who, you know, when you're a five person company, if you're not working 16 hour days every day and like failure is not an option and you don't come up with out of the box ideas, it's it's going to be pretty hard to be successful as like a very small startup. And then you had one really impressive thing under your belt. Three years out of college, you, you created this Google Hire Me uh, .com website and you drove a bunch of traffic to it and it went viral and <laughs> it was all over the press from ABC News to everything, right? Yeah, actually, this is a, this is a good marketing lesson. Not that I ever like showing this picture. If you search your name on Google, the autocomplete is uh, yeah. Matt Epstein viral video. So that's Here, I'll, I'll show you guys what he's talking about. You know, when I, when I first left college, I, uh, or sorry, when I, when I, I lived in Atlanta, worked in advertising for six years, couldn't get a job uh, in tech in San Francisco. I, I quit. I'm like, I'm going to get a job in tech in San Francisco. And it turns out no one in San Francisco wants to hire an advertising guy from Atlanta with no tech background. Um, so I basically recorded this video of myself, uh, in a mustache without pants asking Google for a job. There's actually a lot of stuff that's not in the press. I am um, I spent my life savings on a propeller plane and flew the URL to the website around Google's campus. I printed out giant six foot board cutouts of myself holding up uh, the website URL and shipped it to all of Google's HR offices. Anyway, long story short, I ended up getting an interview with Google. It worked because I, you know, I, while everyone else was sending in resumes, I was flying planes around Google's campus and sending cardboard cutouts of myself. And the same is true for startups. Um, 
if if the thing you're doing is being done in the same way as everyone else, odds are as a five-person company with no brand affinity, very small budget, odds of you beating everyone else is going to be pretty, pretty small. Someone asked, did you get the Google job? Uh, I did not get, I got, I got offers from a few big companies like Salesforce. Google actually did not offer me the job, which, you know, in retrospect, ended up working out for me pretty well. Since then you helped build two unicorns. So that's, that's amazing. And I don't think very many people at Google can say that. How long do you have to wait before you hire that marketing ops person between like the Swiss army knife and marketing <clears throat> ops, you would say? I mean, it's literally the first thing I, I, I literally probably couldn't do it. I hired them immediately. Uh, I mean, just because marketing at this point, it, it's, it's directly linked to your, basically your database and your targeting. And if you don't have marketing operations, you're going to have no visibility into the stuff you're doing. So you could be spending a ton of money and have no idea that it's actually, you know, getting you not really, uh, uh, the unit economics are really terrible. Uh, but also the actual executional work. Um, I'm a lot of things, but like I can barely, or I'm good at a lot of things, but I can barely create a pivot table in Excel. Um, and I for sure, like, you know, barely, I could barely navigate my way around systems like Marketo and Salesforce. So if you, the, the reason ops is so important is the execution and the, and the scale. Like marketing ops is what helps you do things like email, a very, you know, very quickly at a high scale. Um, and so if all you hire is the senior person, they're just going to move so incredibly, sorry, a senior Swiss army knife, they're just going to move insanely slow because they're just going to be bogged down constantly in technical work. Definitely. No, this, that's great advice. And last question here, how do you think about uh, when you interview people, what are some two or three questions you ask to identify that this is the right person for my marketing team? Yeah. It's a good question. If I was going to interview, so if I was going to interview me, um, I would, if I could ask three questions, I think one, I'd want to gauge, is this person a really good salesperson? I'm, I'm really referring to like the very, very early days when you're like less than 30 people. One, I'd want someone who is like basically could sell as well as my best salesperson, because that is, that's essentially what marketing is um you're convincing someone to buy you know cheerios over frosted flakes um so i would probably ask you know tell me uh, what is a product or service you absolutely love and then i'd say great now pretend we walk into a bar and i'm your friend tell me why i should use that service and i think you'll find pretty quickly there's only two camps of people people who sort of melt down and you know fall over their feet or people who they have like pitch you instantly and like you want to buy that product. I think the second thing is I would go down the list of growth channels and probe on basically their experience in things like Facebook, in SEM, in email, um, and how they've used it in their career and like some of the success they seen. Like, you know, great. Uh, you did email at your last company. <clears throat> what was the conversion rate? Uh, how did you get that conversion rate? That kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, I'd really just, I really try to really dig deep on their, their tenacity, their hustle and their grit. And you could do that by asking questions about personal life experience, work experience. Um, but, you know, Parker, for instance, was sold because what person in their right mind spends their whole life savings, you know, flying airplanes around Google and, and doing all this crazy stuff. Like, obviously that's a person who has creativity and grit, asking questions to figure that out from the candidate. At what point in the life cycle do you hire product marketing? I would say pretty late because that Swiss army knife, what they are is a product marketer. And like what you need in the early days is someone to explain your company and your core product and your pitch, just your evergreen pitch. And, and taking that and executing a lot of the campaigns, you know, when you need product marketing is usually when now you have, you're, you're launching tons of products all the time. Your sales force is huge. So I, I mean, I wouldn't hire product, mar product marketing until you've hired those four people.
your Swiss Army knife, your marketing ops person, your growth lead, and then your first product marketer. Fantastic. This was fantastic advice. I learned a ton. People are super engaged. They're focusing. This is one of the best webinars on marketing we've attended. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks for making the time. Thanks cool. everyone for joining us. Thanks, guys. Hope, cool. you, hope you found it useful. It was good, uh, good talking to you all. See you. I need some traction.